Uh, so my name is Marshall Eber. I'm uh, currently the Dean of the School of Computer Science at okay. Carnegie Mellon University. I was the okay. department head of robotics before that and faculty member professor in, in robotics, which is my field. Uh, as you can hear from my way of speaking, I'm not from here. So I got my degrees in France originally. I've been in that field. It depends how you count. I've been at CMU a little over 40 years and I've been in that field probably 46 years, something like that. A long time. <laughs> so one quick question that I have for you is like how did you get interested in research in the first place? What yeah, you? so I was originally in, in mathematics when I was a, a student a, a long time ago. And I had actually the opportunity to do an internship in a lab that was doing uh, computer vision, right? Which is basically having computers interpret what cameras and what sensors see. Uh, that was pretty cool. So I continued uh, in that direction, basically. And computer vision became my field. So it was basically, uh, you know, experience with different projects and uh, this one in particular. That got me started in this direction. I was not really going in this direction at all before. I was more of a pure math person originally. What specifically does your research explore? So my personal research in my group looks at computer vision. So computer vision means taking data from in the form of images or video streams, sometimes depth data, and trying to understand that input. So for example, recognizing things in images and videos, reconstructing 3D uh, shapes and all this in, in the environment. So this is used in every, everything where robots or system operate in the environment. Self-driving is one example. Uh, manufacturing is another example. You know, home robots, applications in healthcare, drones, everything you can think of that needs to see its environment. That's basically the research and in particular, one of the main areas of research that, that my group has done over the past few years is to be able to do this, you need to learn models, right? You need to use machine learning techniques to learn models, just like you learn models for chat GPT and other things, right? Uh, you need to learn models to be able to recognize things in images and videos. And you want to do that in a way that is as automatic as possible so that you don't need to have people label images and videos. It can be done automatically from completely unlabeled data. So that's the uh, kind of research that I do. So this is one of my first papers, actually. This one was back in 83. And this is one of the first paper, as the name indicates, the idea was if you have a robot that observes a scene with three-dimensional objects, how to recognize those three-dimensional objects. So I'm very proud of that paper because that was actually my thesis paper. Mm. Uh, in fact, it's so old that the transcription to PDF, as you can tell, did not work very well. <laughs> the, the main contribution at that time was to uh, compute the uh, transformation between a, a three-dimensional model that is stored in the computer and the three-dimensional scene that is observed by the robot. And the contribution was a mathematical technique to estimate that the transformation. And there were actual results at the end, not very easy to see. Uh, this was actually a three-dimensional part from a uh, auto manufacturer. This was an application to uh, manufacturing. Anyway, that's one. So this was in 83. And if you want to see something from last year, this is an example of what we were doing in a paper last year. So this is what I meant by uh, computer vision. So imagine you have a car, like a self-driving car, right? This is what the car sees. This is an actual video. For some reason, it's, it's kind of slow here. And you can see that there are objects that are segmented out in different colors. So what you want is the, the program, the computer to be able to do this automatically. And what you want to do is to do this as automatically as possible, to be able to do things like this, like you see on the right, discover objects in the environment. You can see the, uh, people, cars, etc., that are different colors. That means that uh, the, the system has uh, seized basically those objects. You want to detect them and you want to be able to track them, like at the bottom here. And so if you're, if you're a self-driving car, you want to be able to do all those things simultaneously and to do this as automatically as possible. So that's the kind of thing that, that we do in that paper. This is work with the uh, Toyota Research Institute. Were there any pivotal moments in your research career that made you change topics, want to pursue a certain topic, or, you know, made you want to say, this is like a topic I want to pursue for the rest of my life? Well, yeah, so it's not, there was never one topic, one very specific topic that I said, that's what I want to do for the mm -hmm. rest of my life. But uh, certainly there were different times 
where things change, you know, and the field changes a lot. Of course, as you know, the field of artificial intelligence and robotics is moving very quickly, so we have to adapt very quickly to new ideas. I would say the, the, the key moment was when I was in a high school and early university college kind of thing. As I told you earlier, I was very much in math, in pure math. And I was uh, way too focused on that. You know, I mean, this, this was the only discipline that really mattered or was, you know, seemed to have anything uh, interesting in it for me. And that was a huge mistake because it prevented me from, you know, looking around and being more curious about other things that may be of interest. So that took me a while, actually, probably too long. To uh, And even at the beginning of my research career, I was still a little bit too concentrating on a, a particular style of work, still a little bit more on the mathematical side of things, and not understanding that there's, there's a lot of other uh, areas that were of interest. So Do you have any person or mentor like in your field that you felt like made the biggest impact on you? Oh yeah, well there are many. So there was uh, I arrived here as a postdoc, right? And my mm -hmm. postdoc advisor Takeo Kanade, who is a very uh, senior professor in in this field in robotics and computer vision, was a, a major influence on what I did, of course. Uh, and there were others uh, here at CMU. That he would be the main one, but there were others here at CMU also uh, senior. And it's very important to uh, listen, n not listen in the sense of following what they do. That's not what I mean. But uh, listen to the kind of things that they, that they look at, the kind of things that they talk about, etc. Again, in this idea of, of having a more open mind about the disciplines and not getting into this, you know, the expression, uh, the, the little shiny object, you know, and getting excited about one thing and sticking to it. And I think it's very important through mentorship to really understand in a, in a broader way, you know, the field, the discipline, etc. Thank you so much. And I guess like one final question for this section is where do you feel like your research field is expanding to? So, you know, what are like the future visions for this research field and what other topics can be explored? We're going to go through more and more general models. So what I mean by that is the following. Many years ago, when we were doing computer vision or AI or machine learning in general, what we would do is to have specialized approaches for different applications, right? So in computer vision, you would have, for example, something that would uh, detect cars in, in videos and something else that would detect people, right? And something else that would do three-dimensional reconstruction, right? And what we're going now, of course, is to have much more general approaches just like as, as people, right? It's not that we have uh, different, you know, different parts of the brain that do those, those different things. We have some kind of more general representation of the world, more general vision capability to understand the environment. That's where the field is going. And this is, by the way, the same direction that the field is going with different aspects of artificial intelligence. Like you've heard of large language models, which are behind chat GPT. It's the same kind of idea, having very general model of language that can then be used for a number of tasks. It's the same thing for computer vision. You have very general model of what it means to see things, basically, what visual data means that can be used for different tasks. So that's one of the key areas. The, the other thing is uh, some more integration of all the aspects of uh, sensing and robotics, right? It used to be that we were looking at computer vision and language and motion, you know, physical motion of robots, all of those things kind of separately. And now we more and more looking at them together into one, one big integrated approach, which is closer to you know, biological systems. That's another evolution. The reason why I wanted to make a comment about me is that now I'm more in an administrative position. So I don't do a lot of research myself. I showed you a little bit what we do with Toyota, but it's still, it's, it's only a little bit. So I'm not myself going to contribute a lot to those future development. Okay. I guess since you did a, like, a lot of research in the past, like in the past, what did you enjoy most about research? Or like what propelled you forward basically? Well, so it's, it's what's exciting about research is to, to explore completely new ideas that at the time that you explore them, maybe are not that mm -hmm. applicable right away to the real world, you know, but you know, there's a possibility that down the road, they will have a transformative effect, 
right? You know, I arrived at CMU in 84 as part of the first national project in the U.S. on what is now called self-driving, autonomous cars, etc. It was not called that then. It was called autonomous vehicles in 84. And the project was something called the Autonomous Land Vehicle, ALV. It was funded by DARPA uh, from the government, and it was the first attempt at building things that drive themselves. Now, of course, it was in 84, so it was still pretty uh, primitive. But my point is that even though it was primitive, it was a unique new capability. It had never been done before. Uh, It was a unique new capability, number one. And number two, there's the uh, satisfaction of seeing that 30, 40 years later, it has developed into an entire industry. You see what I mean? So there is this the satisfaction of being there at the beginning. This is a video from a TV program. Now this one is slightly later. It's probably 1990. Okay, so it's uh, 1992. So it's about 30 years ago. And this is one of the first research programs to do off-road self-driving in open terrain. I guess this has to be one of the strangest things I've ever taken a ride in. Nobody seems to be in charge. Is this driving itself now? It's driving itself now. You can see the steering wheel turning. Yeah. Okay. How does it know where to go? I designated the goal point about uh, 100 meters away. The goal point that Marshall has chosen cannot be reached directly. There are obstacles in the way. Using pictures from a set of TV cameras, the onboard system generates height and position information for the terrain ahead decides which features are too big to be ignored, and then plots a course around them. This is one of a long series of experiments to develop autonomous vehicles, vehicles that can get around on their own. The work has been continuing for more than a decade at Carn. Okay. Thank you so much. So you can see the excitement, right? When you can do things like that, that's pretty exciting environment. All right. Thank you so much. So where did you start your journey into your field to answer research in general? So like basic lab positions, any internships you held in the beginning? Yeah. So like I said, I was in uh, math initially, so not doing research or related thing or anything. I got an internship pre-doctorate at a research institution, looking at things that what we call now computer vision, which I found exciting. So I continued to do a a doctorate uh, PhD on this. And then I came here as a postdoc on the kind of project that you saw in that video, an earlier version of that project in in 84, again, working on computer vision for for robotics, for autonomous systems uh, in this case. And then I started working on other topics in computer vision, many other topics. Uh, So that's basically how it all happened. I have not moved around. Some people move around a lot in between different internships and things. I have not moved around uh, that much. I've done a lot of different things in the in the research, but basically at the same place here at CMU. So how is CMU as a general experience? Is it like a really good institute to work at? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. In fact, according to the latest ranking of newest news on World Report, we uh, we rank number one in AI uh, graduate programs. So that's good. So yes, in that sense, that's a good place. <laughs> uh, we have a very large school of computer science, which covers, you know, the thing that is the most exciting here is the breadth of topic that we cover from the core computer science, you know, programming language, et cetera, to robotics, as we just discussed. And in between human computer interaction with people who are computer scientists, but also designers, social scientists, psychologists, et cetera, to machine learning fundamentals, to things that are more on the mathematical side, all the way to even, we have a department out of our seven department that looks at computational biology meaning using AI and machine learning for biology research, precision medicine, genomics, cancer research, etc. So that's the exciting part from very theoretical, mathematical aspects of computer science all the way to physical system, to research in the sciences. So the breadth of the portfolio is really what is exciting here. Thank you so much. And so how did you find your passion? And then more specifically, how do you suggest like high schoolers like me find their passion in research? Well, I guess uh, being curious, curiosity is the most important thing. I I told you before, the biggest mistake I made is to limit myself to a particular field, believing that that's the only subfield that matters, right? The the only discipline that matters. That is a huge mistake. So I'm not sure I can tell you exactly what to do, but I can tell you what not to do. 
What not to do is to follow the kind of advice that says you should really study only this or you should really, you know, do research or interest yourself only in, in this area. That is the wrong advice always. And so the, the opposite is what you need to do. You need to keep an open mind, you know, be curious, look around. And like I said, don't get obsessed with the latest uh, shiny object, no matter how fantastic it is, like the new AI tools, etc. What kind of skills can high schoolers develop if like they don't have access to a field or they don't know what they're going to do like, in the future yet? Oh, yeah. Well, there are some fundamentals. You know, what we want here at CMU is math skills are the most important. Okay. The uh, math and adjacent uh, fields, of course, physics, etc. But that kind of thinking, the kind of uh, not just computational thinking, but, you know, reasoning mathematical reasoning type of things, abstraction. This can be gained in various ways. I'm not talking necessarily formal mathematics, but I'm talking any field, any uh, training, any uh, experience that can gain that kind of experience. The other thing that's important, of course, is anything that has to do with being able to present ideas. Uh, sometimes people forget that, you know, sometimes the technical skills get the uh, priority, which is fine. But it's very important to be able to communicate and present those those ideas. And then how did you narrow down like your specific research field or how did your friend others like narrow down their research fields? Like, you know, maybe you have a general interest in, for example, like biology. You know, how, how did you narrow down your field? Yeah. So again, people may have different advice, complete, the complete opposite advice. Okay. <laughs> but uh, if you're talking at the high school level, I would not worry too much personally about narrowing down the field. The more important thing is the fundamental, the, the, the fundamental knowledge in math and various other things that everybody needs, no matter what field, and keeping an open mind and being curious. So narrowing down too early to me is a bad idea because okay. you will be surprised but by what you will find in, the, in those fields. Again, I told you several times already, I was in a pure math. I had no interest initially in the kind of more, slightly more engineering type of things like robotics, computer vision. I was amazed when I started doing it at what it is and what, what I can do and the kind of things that we can explore. I would not know that if I had continued with my decision of narrowing down. All right. And I guess one of the last questions we have for you is what traits define a like, great researcher in their field? Or I guess a sub-question is what type of traits are you looking for in a potential lab member in your lab? Well, you know, I'm going to repeat myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. You see that one coming. To be uh, open-minded, to be curious. Mm -hmm. Look, when I talk to people and I meet somebody who tells me, well, this is not interesting because it's not X enough. You know, it's not mathematical enough or it's not applied enough or it's not enough of, I don't know, of AI or there's not enough of this. I tend to discard that discussion because that's a sign of someone who does not have the right attitude. You cannot discard things. You cannot rule out ideas and disciplines and all that, especially those that you don't necessarily as familiar with. Those are the ones, in fact, that you should, you know, kind of listen to and be more curious. So that's the attitude that to me characterizes a good researcher. Thank you so much. I think that was the last question I had for you. And it's a great time talking with you.